A huge national survey found that over half of Americans, about 54%, have at least one common allergy. And Europeans aren't much better off. A massive international study of more than 7,000 kids across multiple countries found similar rates of asthma, hay fever, and eczema across Europe. But one community seems almost immune to allergies, the Amish. According to recent reporting in the Washington Post, one study of Amish kids found that only 7% showed any allergic response at all, making the Amish one of the least allergic populations ever measured in the entire world. So what's going on here? Is it something in the environment? Is it genetics? Or could it be that their way of life, their religiously structured farming, food, and family practices has created a social world that shields them from allergies? And if that's the case, what does it tell us about the role religion itself plays in shaping public health? The Amish are a Christian ethno-religious group that grew out of the Anabaptist movement in 16th century Europe. They came to North America in the 1700s, and today there are about 400,000 of them, mostly in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, as well as in Ohio and Indiana. The hallmark of Amish life is separation from the modern world. They strive to live what they call a plain life, guided by local church rules known as the Ordnung. These rules govern everything, from their clothing to the selective use of technology. Amish communities famously reject cars, phones, TVs, and the internet. But they don't just shun all technology. Instead, they weigh each innovation against its potential to disrupt family life, faith, and community. For example, in some Amish communities, a tractor powered by diesel fuel might be acceptable if it's used only in farming. But a car that allows people to scatter far from home is usually not. Beyond technology, Amish religious values emphasize community over individualism. They reject social security and health insurance and instead practice mutual aid. If a family has a medical expense, neighbors rally to cover that cost. They value humility and obedience to God's will, a concept that they call Galassenheit, or self-surrender. All of this fosters small, tightly-knit rural communities where religion directly shapes daily routines. And as it turns out, those same traditions that shape Amish daily life might also be doing something else, protecting them from allergies in ways that scientists are only now beginning to understand. Let's circle back to that 7% figure. This came from a 2012 study when researchers compared allergies among Amish kids in Indiana with kids in Switzerland. Why Switzerland? Well, the Amish emigrated from regions around there about 200 years ago, so they argued it provides a meaningful cultural and genetic comparison. The team tested about 138 Amish kids ages 6 to 12, and then lined up their results with tens of thousands of Swiss kids who were already part of a huge allergy study. And as I mentioned, only about 7% of the Amish kids showed any allergic reaction. Meanwhile, the Swiss kids who grew up on farms came in at about 25%, and Swiss kids growing up in urban settings, a whopping 44%. Asthma showed the same pattern, lowest among the Amish kids, higher among the Swiss farm kids, and even higher in Swiss urban kids. What makes this study even more interesting is that the Amish and Swiss farm kids had similar exposures. Most spent their time in barns, drank raw milk, and lived in large families. And yet the Amish numbers were still way lower, suggesting that there's some extra protective factors in Amish life. A few years later, another study was published in 2016 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This compared two groups of farming communities in the U.S., the Amish of Indiana and the Hutterites of South Dakota. At first glance, the Amish and the Hutterites look similar. Both are Anabaptist groups that emigrated from around the same time from Central Europe. Both eat traditional diets rich in raw milk and homegrown food, both live in large families, and both avoid tobacco smoke and air pollution. They even have similar genetic ancestry. But just like in the Swiss comparison, the Amish once again came out with dramatically lower rates of asthma and allergies. Only about 5% of Amish kids had asthma compared to 21% among Hutterite kids. Sensitivity to allergies followed the same pattern, 7% for Amish versus 33% for Hutterites. And finally, similar findings were reported in yet another study, this time comparing the Amish to a group that on the surface looks almost identical, the Old Order Mennonites. Like the Amish, the Mennonites are Anabaptists of Swiss-German origin, who also live in rural communities and practice traditional farming. But, once again, just like the Swiss farm kids and the Hutterites, the pattern held. The Amish showed far fewer allergies. At the household level, about 26% of Amish families reported someone with allergies, compared to nearly 47% of Mennonite families. At the individual level, Amish kids and adults also had significantly lower rates of asthma, eczema, hay fever, and food allergies compared to the Old Order Mennonites. So what's going on here? Why are rates of allergies among the Amish so low, even when compared to their closest cultural cousins? It turns out the answer might literally be in the dust. And yes, Amish dust is now an official term in the scientific literature. 
The researchers in that Amish Hutterite study measured dust collected from both houses, and they found that Amish houses were absolutely teeming with microbial life. The endotoxin levels in Amish dust were nearly seven times higher than in Hutterite dust. Now, endotoxin levels sound scary, but this just means the fragments from the outer wall of certain bacteria, which show up in dust when bacteria are abundant. The researchers tested this dust in mice. They took the dust samples from Amish homes, stirred them into a solution, and then gave that to lab mice by literally dripping it into their noses. The mice had been primed to develop asthma-like reactions using allergens like egg proteins or dust mites, so the setup mimicked what happens in allergic kids. When the mice got exposed to Amish dust, their asthma symptoms were drastically reduced. But when the researchers tried the exact same experiment with Hutterite dust, nothing happened. A 2023 study set out to pinpoint what makes Amish dust so unusually protective. The researchers compared dust from Amish and European cow sheds to dust from European sheep sheds. And the results were clear. Cow shed dust consistently shielded mice from asthma-like inflammation, while sheep dust had no effect. And it turned out it was all about the protein content of cow sheds. Two proteins dominate in cow sheds. One is called BOSD2, which comes from cattle skin and sweat glands, and the other is called odorant binding protein, or OBP, which is normally produced in the mucous membrane of the nasal cavities of mammals. Both are lipocalins, or transport proteins, whose job is exactly what it sounds like, carrying stuff around. Both of these proteins can bind with water-repelling molecules like fatty acids, latch onto the receptors on the surface of cells, and even link up with larger molecules floating around in your mucus and blood. This makes lipocalins perfectly suited to ferry their cargo right into the membrane of your airways and influence how those cells respond. When researchers analyzed these proteins in Amish dust, they found them loaded with fatty acids from the farm environment oils from hay and grass, plant-derived polyunsaturated fats, the membrane lipids of bacteria and fungi that live in the barnyard air, animal hides, and manure. The thinking is that the cow proteins bind to these fatty acid packages and then deliver those packages right into the lining of your airways, which then trains the immune system to stand down instead of overreacting to harmless stuff like pollen or dust mites. And Amish dust is pretty potent stuff. One fraction from Amish farm dust, just a half a percent of the total, was enough to completely suppress asthma symptoms in mice. And this transport protein fatty acid combo is really necessary. When the researchers stripped those fatty acids out using solvents, the dust lost its protective power. So it's not not enough to just have fatty acids floating around, and it's not enough to have cow proteins floating around, the immune calibrating effects only seems to work when the two are working together. This fits into a bigger pattern that scientists have been talking about for years. Medical scientists call it the farm effect. Kids who grow up on traditional farms are far less likely to develop asthma and allergies. But not all farms are created equal. The farm effect shows up most strongly in kids growing up on traditional dairy farms, where they have constant early life contact with cows, hay, and the barns themselves. That's why kids in Amish families show such strikingly low rates of asthma and allergies. They're breathing in that barnyard air, full of microbial life, from cows, straw, and soil, day in and day out, basically from the time they can walk. Meanwhile, genetically similar Hutterite kids grow up on large industrialized farms where the animals are kept in centralized facilities, and kids have far less daily contact with them. They don't really start working the animal facilities until around 12 years old. The difference in exposure seems to make all the difference in their immune systems, as does the farm environment itself. And this is the crucial connection. The Amish way of life is not the result of some conscious public health strategy. It's not like they're rejecting cars or industrial farming to lower their allergy rates. They're following their individual communities ordnung, a set of community rules and traditions rooted in religious belief, practice, and identity. But those same rules structure daily labor, housing, and childhood experiences in ways that unintentionally produce a highly protective environment for childhood allergies. In other words, what looks like a health advantage is really a byproduct of a broader religious social system. Public health experts have a term for these kinds of upstream social influences. Social determinants of health. A social determinant of health is basically anything in your social environment that shapes your well-being, the conditions in which you're born, grow up, work, and age. It's stuff like income, gender, education, race, neighborhood safety, a strong social support network, access to clean water, or whether you have good public transit to get you to a doctor's appointment. In many ways, when it comes to your health, your zip code is as important as your genetic code. Now, religion might not be the first thing you think of when you hear social determinant of health, but scholars over the years have argued it absolutely belongs in the conversation. One of the leading voices here is the sociologist Ellen Eidler. In her book, Religion as a Social Determinant of Public Health, she points out that religion can influence health in all sorts of ways. 
For example, religious communities create built-in social support systems. Members of religious communities often form strong, enduring relationships that can provide emotional comfort and material aid in times of need. These networks, whether formed through weekly worship, volunteer activities, or simply through marriage and community involvement, have been linked to lower mortality from all causes and lower rates of depression. Religious communities also exert social control, encouraging or discouraging certain behaviors, like don't smoke or don't drink alcohol. Practices like these shape long-term health on both the individual and population level. For example, a study of cancer incidents among the Ohio Amish found that they develop cancer at much lower rates compared to the general Ohio population. Overall, the Amish had 40% fewer new cancer cases than other adults in the state. Their lower rate of tobacco usage was at least partially responsible for this reduced cancer risk. Though the researchers really didn't know what other factors, if any, might account for the rest of the difference. Some of these effects can be harmful as well. Sectarian groups with high rates of intermarriage, like the Amish and Hasidic Jews, see increased prevalence of certain genetic disorders. But taken together, these findings show that religion is absolutely an important social determinant of health. Its influence is complex, it's sometimes beneficial and sometimes harmful, but always working in the background. And the Amish make a compelling example of religion as a social determinant of health because their religious norms have produced a distinct set of living conditions with measurable health consequences. No Amish communities or Nung ever mentions allergens or immune modulation, but their rules about technology, land use, and community life have created a social life where families work in small traditional farms which means kids have daily contact with animals and barns from an early age, which means they're breathing in air carrying a constant stream of protein-rich dust into their lungs. In public health terms, that's a highly unusual environment, one that most of the developed world has engineered out of existence. And in critical religious studies terms, this case study demonstrates how religion involves way more than sacred texts or individual belief or doctrines. Religion can structure entire ways of living that shape not only the social environments that people inhabit, but also their physical and microbial worlds. Health misinformation is rampant online, and sometimes it's hard to tell what's credible. That's why I use today's sponsor, Ground News, a news comparison website and app that lets you see how a single story is being covered across the political spectrum. Take, for example, a recent story about a massive measles outbreak in Texas, over 4,500 cases and 16 deaths. Coverage of the outbreak looks very different depending on whether you're reading left, center, or right outlets, and Ground News makes those differences immediately clear. Here, Ground News has aggregated a bunch of outlets covering the story. Using their quick visual breakdowns, you can see the vast majority of these sources are left-leaning and rated as highly factual. Here at the bottom you can see the ownership chart, showing if these sources are independently owned, owned by wealthy private owners, private equity, or media conglomerates. Ground News also enables you to easily compare the headlines. From the right, the Washington Examiner ran with, RFK Jr.'s leadership brought an end to the Texas measles outbreak, a framing that sides with the administration. On the left, the Independent led with, Texas health officials were ignored by CDC as measles crisis grew. Because right-wing sources barely covered the story, it appears in Ground News' blind spot feed. A blind spot is when a story gets covered heavily by one side of the political spectrum, and barely mentioned by the other. The blind spot feed shows you exactly which stories you're most likely to be missing, grouping articles on the same topic together and organizing them by political leaning. If you'd like to give Ground News a try, Ground News is giving viewers 40% off their Vantage plan. Go to ground.news slash for breakfast or click the link in the description below to get started. And support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.